See, that's the part. How do you deny a person's lived history? I, mm -hmm. I, went, to the, I went to the back of white people's houses. I sat in the back of the bus. I lived through those things. I can't talk to students in a Florida school about my lived experiences under Jim Crow because somebody white might feel bad. Mm. Next week, I'm going to do it. I don't give a damn who feels bad or who doesn't. I think I'll <laughs> see me to know that my lived experience was Jim Crow and how it affected me and other people as well. Welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us today on the journey towards self mastery. Our next guest is a psychologist, author, activist, and a world-renowned, award-winning historian. He has dedicated his career to preserving and sharing Florida's black history. He has served as chair of the psychology department at Florida International University. He's the founder of the Dr. Dunn Academy for Community Education. He's the only black person in the country that owns land in Rosewood, Florida. He's the producer and director of three documentary films. He's also founder of the Miami Center for Racial Justice. Let's welcome today, Dr. Marvin Dunn to the program. Dr. Dunn, how are you doing today, sir? Thank, thank you very much. You know, I love how you briefly interviewed me. I sometimes labor over people going through details of this and that. Thank you very much for that very short, to the point introduction. I'm very happy to be with you. Indeed. I mean, you are walking black history. If we did the whole thing, we would be here for hours, man. That's why I'm glad you did it. <laughs> the folks will need to hear all that stuff. Yes, sir. And um, definitely an honor having you on the program. I've actually heard some of your work for a while. You know, I have people that, that live in Florida. I was a little curious about some of the history in Florida and things like that. You know, when you see Confederate signs, you know, flying around in Florida all the time, you kind of wonder, like, you know, what, <laughs> where this all come from. And there's some things happening in Florida right now. And it kind of made me th think about like historically, right? If you're learning history and right now things are changing where you can get facts from anywhere and people got a lot of different things to say about what happened and history sometimes can be very mm -hmm. confusing. So right now, Florida is saying that black people actually benefited from slavery. This is one of the things that you're fighting. <laughs> they learn new skills. You know, and guess what? You know, black people they participate. They brought those from Africa, man. <laughs> black people were, were, iron, were doing iron working in the night thousands of years ago. They were, they, they were iron. So the, the idea that our folks came here ignorant, without skills, without things that would enable them to survive as people is ridiculous. They did not need white people to teach them how to be blacksmiths. They were doing it thousands of years before they got put on slave ships. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for sharing that, by the way. But where I was going with that was that if I am, you know, a high school kid, I'm not aware that a Dr. Marvin Dunn exists and I'm in school, I'm in my history class and my, my teacher's talking about this and, you know, black people benefited from slavery and this is what they learned. This is what slavery gave them. And, you know, it wasn't just the white people that were, you know, violent towards the black people, but Black people were violent towards white people as well. The reason we're not teaching critical race theory is because it's discriminatory and this and that and the third. So if I'm this high school kid, I've never heard of Dr. Marvin Dunn. How do I separate truth from falsehood, you know, reality versus fiction? Like, how do mm -hmm. I know, you know, some of the things that, you know, maybe now or in the future that I'm going to be hearing about in class is not the reality? What, what deciphers truth from reality when we look at history? First of all, thank you for having me on. I appreciate that. Yes. I wrote a book called uh, A History of Florida Through Black Eyes, which examined many of the cases of racial violence against blacks in Florida. You want to know what happened in Florida uh, with blacks and whites in terms of our history of violence? Read that book, A History of Florida Through Black Eyes. It's on Amazon. To tell all those stories took years to go to graveyards, churches, to sit down with descendants of people who were lynched, to sit down with descendants of people who did the lynching, to try to put these stories together took 20 years. And, and I put them together in that book, and I suggest folks go to that and find out some of the things that happened in Florida that they may never have exact, never may have imagined exact uh, happened in the, uh, the state of Florida. Read the book. Mm. So is there a way of looking at like history 
in regards to identifying what exactly like you say you've been in graveyards you've you've interviewed people you have traveled all over like how do you yourself collect history and put it into a book as fact like what what decipher is that for you i have to first separate myself from the facts in terms of my feelings i can't let my feelings become involved when i read about learn about and read about a 15-year-old boy in Lago, Florida, 1944, being lynched by three white men for writing a letter to a white girl. As a historian, I can't tell those stories if I let my emotions flow into the story. And that's very difficult to do because I feel the pain of all the, of these events that I've studied. But to be credible, to be accurate, to be fair, takes a certain amount of intellectual and emotional distance from the telling of the stories. And that's what I've tried to do. Uh, and that's what I hope people will take from the work that I've done. Florida is a very, very, very troubled state. We have been from the very beginning. This is not new for us. We have always had deep racial problems. Uh, and today those problems have emerged in a way that we're finding very, very, very difficult to, to, to manage. Gotcha. So let's imagine I'm a high school student. I'm listening to you. I know you're going to speak to high school class pretty soon. And I'm like, well, Dr. Dunn, it's 2024. Like, why are we talking about the 1880s and what happened in 1930? Like, mm -hmm. what relevance does this history thing have to do with right now? How does it help me now learning these things? A friend of mine sent me years ago uh, the sign that was on a railroad car that said colored seat from rear. The colored coach was identified by this son. I have it. I'm going to go to this middle school next week. They're going to have 12 classes in social studies or history in an auditorium. And I'm going to stand there with that sign, colored coach. I have another one that says colored seat from rear that, that uh, was on buses. You put those signs in your hand and you're 83 years old and you stand in front of a class of kids who are 12 to 13 and 14 years old and say to them, how would you have felt if when you got onto a train or a bus and you were black and there was a sign that said, colored seat from rear? That is what I experienced. That is what millions of black people experienced in my generation. You need to know this. You need to more than know it, you need to feel it. Not to be guilt, feel guilt or anger, but you need to know what happened and not just the facts, but the impact emotionally on people who were subjected to Jim Crow. And having lived through that experience, I want to try to teach students how to relate to the pain of, of racism. And you need eight decades of kind of a historical long glass to look back from 1940 when I was born, when Roosevelt was president, to today. So I'm not even sure how the school system will relate to me talking to, to auditorium full of students, telling them about this, re, 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 uh, sharing my lived history. See, that's the part. How do you deny a person's lived history? I, I, went, to the, I went to the back of white people's houses. I sat in the back of the bus. I lived through those things. I can't talk to students in a Florida school about my lived experiences under Jim Crow because somebody white might feel bad. Mm. Next week, I'm going to do it. I don't give a damn who feels bad, who doesn't. I think I'll <laughs> see to know that my lived experience was Jim Crow and how it affected me and other people as well. Indeed. And I, and I would say, let's just be consistent, right? Like the uh, Holocaust is not a good feeling event. It's not people are not laughing and smiling and, you know, kids are crying and emotional and you know, as they should, <laughs> as yes. they should be, absolutely. You know, but but yeah. they go through it. They have to never forget, never forget. Exactly. I, I've taken <laughs> students. We have, we have a wonderful Holocaust Museum on Miami Beach. I've taken my invite Florida uh, international students to the Holocaust Museum for years. I had them go and see that suffering. My students at FIU. Why? Because I wanted them to relate to the pain that Jews had and that horrible experience that they had. And you need to be able to see something, touch something to really experience that, mm -hmm. which is why we take students to Rosewood and to these other places where these horrible things happen to black people. History has to be felt, not just taught. Mm. I agree, I agree. 
And, um, you know, we cannot have this conversation, obviously, without talking about your life because your life is black history, like you mentioned before. You know, um, we can't exclude that. We can't ignore that, that you have lived this life where, you know, it wasn't easy coming up as a black male as, and, and becoming a black man in, in that world. So you live in Jim Crow South Florida. Yeah. Can you walk us well, through some of that experience for you? And then also, too, I wonder, like, were you aware of these laws and these separations of people or were you finding out these things the hard way or was there this sense of awareness that you're not supposed to drink this water you're not supposed to go here you're not supposed to do that like what was that experience for you growing up i remember when i first realized that being black was a problem i was seven years old i was in deland florida central florida Volusia county before my family moved to miami and at that time black people could not use uh, have bank accounts so black people kept their money in the post office and i was with my mom i was about seven i knew i had to have to have been about seven because because i knew you need to stand in line rather than just be everybody's for himself and we were at the post office and these white people kept getting in front of my mother again and again and again and i'm standing there loose and i asked her when we got outside why were those people why were they getting in front of us mm. and she said because we're colored because we're colored. You say that to a seven-year-old child, have you any, any idea how that sears your soul? Which means, okay, so that me, it, exactly. You can, how could you? How old are you, son? 34, are you? 34 years young, son. <laughs> I've got a grandson your age. How could you possibly imagine this? So but we need people, particularly black people, to be able to imagine it. My mom would get on a, on a bus in the land, Florida, with me and my four brothers on a Saturday night just to ride to have something to do. And as we got on the bus and walked past the white people, she would hold our hands and not, sort of huddle us together to get back past the white people to the back section. And then we would, she would relax. Mm. And there we were. So what do you think? You got five young little boys coming up and again and again and again, you see white people up front, black people up in, in the back. What does that do to your sense of self? Despite what you would rather it have on your uh, on your on your development, it tells you you're not as good mm -hmm. as those people up front. You're not as good as the people who you know who ride in front of the bus. I was one of the kids. I was a I was a good student. They would my teachers would send me with a teacher or someone else to the white school to get the books that the white students were done with because they were getting new books. Mm -hmm. It hurts me to talk about it even now. I would go over and get their marked up textbooks, pages ripped out. I love Sue, Sue loved me, and take those to us mm. because they were getting from the state of Florida, Ron DeSantis, the new textbooks. Mm. And the psychologically, the, the, the dangerous and sad thing about that is that we were glad to get them. Mm. We were glad in 1940, 52 or 50 to get those books. That's, that's, all, that's all you guys yeah. knew. That's all you knew. That's all we knew. The white folks are done. We'll take that. Mm. But see, well, see, that was slavery. The white folks gave us what they didn't need, what they didn't want, and it was sort of thrown to us. And we, we, we survived that way. So I'm just, but I'm, I'm just trying to speak for the moment right. about how the impact of that affected a child a black child in the 1940s and 50s, and how it, how it affected me and my brothers uh, in a very, very significant way. Mm. Yeah, that, that is uh, fascinating. So I wanna fast forward a little bit through your childhood. You end up getting accepted to Morehouse on a full scholarship. Yeah, that's right. And you know, your, your parents told you, make sure you get your, you know, make sure you get your butt on the back of the bus and this and that and the third. No, no but... don't, tell this story. don't make me tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> I just visited my parents' graves last weekend. I go to see mom and pop mm. from time to time. You need to do that. Yeah. Keep in touch with the ancestors. They're still there. But uh, in, in 1957, I got admitted to Morehouse College out of the 11th grade. I was, a, I got, I was 16 mm. when I got admitted to Morehouse. They were looking for uh, young people in the South who could be admitted to college early because they had certain promises that they thought were important. And I, I, was, I was admitted. So uh, from Miami, Florida, late August, 1957, my mother, 
my grandmom and my dad took me down to the Greyhound bus station in Miami, Florida. And my grandmother and my mom put me on the back seat of that bus with a little bag of lunch, bologna sandwich, and back potato chips, and a, a sweet potato, because my grandmother knew I loved it. And they said, okay, we're going to pray for you. My, we're going to pray. My, my grandmother and my mom were sanctified people. They went to church two or three times a week. Mm-hmm. We're going to pray for you, honey. Don't move off this seat till you get to It's Sunday night. Until you get to Atlanta tomorrow, you stay right here on this seat and don't you move. And then they got off the bus. And then my dad got on the bus. My dad was not sanctified. Uh, my dad was a longshoreman. And uh, when he wanted to get the attention of his five sons, he tended to use the N-word. Mm-hmm. So my dad said to me, listen here, little N-word. <laughs> you stay your little back ass in this back seat and don't you move until you get to Atlanta tomorrow, after, tomorrow afternoon. You understand me, little N-word? Okay, Pop. Okay, I got it, Pop. He gets off the bus. The bus leaves that night, gets to Fort Lauderdale, and I got up and moved to the middle of the bus. God knows why I did that. My mother said, what possessed you? <laughs> what would you do something stupid? What possessed you to do? Moved it to the middle of the bus, and for some reason it felt better. Mm. Not even, but then that Sunday night, white people were getting on the bus and sitting behind me. The bus by that Monday morning was in Waycross, Georgia. It was full of people, almost and it's not full of people. It stopped in Waycross to take on students, high school students, who were using that Greyhound bus to get to school. A little white girl sat down next to me, a high school student. And, and as soon as she did that, you could hear a pin drop on that bus. Mm-hmm. I had never been that close to a white person. And uh, someone finally said from the back, a white person from the behind me, nigga, get up. Mm-hmm. Nigga, get back here where you belong. Other people joined him in that. What, what do you think you are? Get, get back here. And some of the black people back on the back of the bus were saying, honey, come on back, honey. And a white Marine stood up in uniform. It was a corporal, the Marine Corps, stood up and said, why are you bothering him? He's not black. And they forgot about me and turned on this man. He must be a Jew. I remember that specifically. He must be a Jew. Why would they have said that? He must be from up north. This, you don't know how we do things down here. And uh, they forgot about me. The bus driver and I were outside of town, pulls the bus over into a, a, a gas station, walks back to me. He pointed at me. He said, you are creating a disturbance on this bus. I'm putting you off. And that man gave me my little cardboard suitcase that my mom and grandma had packed for me and put me off at this gas station and said, wait for the next bus to Atlanta. Be bound about three hours, which I did. The bus came and I went on to Atlanta. But you know, when that second bus came and I got on it, where do, where do you think I sat? Straight in the back. Probably the very last seat. What my mama told me. Uh, but you know, on the other hand, when I finished Morehouse in 1961 and returned on a ground bus to, to Miami, by that time the laws had changed. I sat right behind the driver. Wow. That is fact. Did you realize, like, at that time, like, your life was in danger? Like, did you have that understanding? Or... Oh, yes. Man. But yes. I don't know. I guess for, for a moment, it didn't matter. Hmm. I'm not sure why it didn't matter, but uh, it, it should have. Mm-hmm. But it didn't. I don't know. I just had to move to the middle of that bus for whatever reason. God knows at this point. Man, that's interesting. So, Morehouse. You went to Morehouse with so many people. Yes. Too many yes. to name. But uh, one of the points um, that I read that stands out was that you uh, ended up while you were at Morehouse going to see Dr. King speak a, a few times, and then um, mm-hmm. uh, Malcolm yes. X. Malcolm X speak. So. Yes. Um, what were those experiences like, you know, seeing these men speak at that time? And what do you remember about it? Well, Morehouse College is a, is a black male school, Baptist college. And in 1957, when I got there, uh, Morehouse was particularly uh, con- committed to making sure that we had character built by black preachers. So we had to go to chapel five days a week. And they would bring in these speakers to talk to us. And five days a week of speakers mean you know, you, have, you got to have a lot of speakers to come in. And every now and then they would have this little jack leg preacher from Alabama, preacher from Miami, named Martin Luther King Jr. to come to talk to the men of Morehouse at a nine o'clock chapel meeting. And we had to be there whether we wanted to or not. Some of us wore our pajamas under our coats to appear to be dressed. 
and King would come and he would speak, and the men of Morehouse would go to sleep. <laughs> listen, listen, you laugh. Maynard Jackson, after whom the Atlanta airport is named, was in my class. Maynard went to sleep too. <laughs> so did Julian Bond. Julian Bond was in my class, became the first black congressman from Georgia, head of the national NAACP. Julian, we all slept. King was boring. <laughs> he didn't have anything to say. He was a little young preacher. Now, if Daddy King came in, you know, his father, who was a very, very big preacher in Atlanta, then we all set up. We yeah. all dressed up. But Martin was just, okay, all right, Martin King coming again. This little did we know mm. that we were sitting in the face of history. Mm. Mm. Now, but, but on the other hand, the, the, just to, to, to tell the Malcolm piece, the first week that I got to Morehouse, I, uh, we were we born just the freshman on campus, and the custodian of the building, Graves Hall, said to some of us, "When why don't you all go over to the mosque on Auburn Avenue and listen to this young uh, young minister out of New York? Uh, he's a Muslim. He's a uh, follows Elijah Muhammad. We, well, nothing to do, but better choices. So we all went to hear Malcolm speak that Saturday night at this mosque in Atlanta on Auburn Avenue. I'd never been to a place where they search a church where the, the men and women sit on different sides and they search you before you go in. But mm. that was the way it was. Standing room only. I got a seat. No, no idea what to expect. No one else spoke. No one else was on the stage except Malcolm. Mm. No introduction. He just walked out and started talking. He was amazing. I don't remember anything King said, but I remember what Malcolm said. Mm. That I never heard him speak again. But he went on and on and on about black people have to defend themselves in this country, no matter what the cost. You have a right to do that. He went on and went on and on about the black of the berry, the sweet of the juice. Be proud that you're black. And then he went down on America as being a racist country. There's no reason for us to fight for this country or defend this country. It's, it's, it's against black people. And then he burned the American flag on stage. I saw Malcolm wow. do that. He wowed me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he could have been there. And people were clapping. But I wasn't clapping. I, d I didn't get that part. Mm. I, I didn't get the part that Malcolm was saying about all white people are devils. I just didn't get that. I was, people were clapping. And I'm feeling, why is it? But that is where Malcolm was in 1957. You know, and everybody knows, he moved on from that. His, his views moderated. It became much more open to white people and others being involved in the movement. But at that moment in 1957, when I'm sitting, sitting listening to him, he was rising. And he was Malcolm at his best. And it scared me. Hmm. It did, I admit it scared me. And then uh, when he eventually died, it struck me in my heart because he had been such a soldier, such a brave man. He knew he was going to die. He knew it was coming. He almost knew what night they were going to kill him. Mm -hmm. And he still spoke his piece. So, you know, he and King are both great heroes of mine for different reasons. Yeah, that is that is powerful. Um, so that was the beginning of, you know, your, your, your tenure. You went on to to the Navy. I know these these are a lot of stories, but I'm just going to fast forward this one. You were in the Navy. There was a time frame where uh, President Kennedy was going in there and they prepared for him. And you're like the only black person, like one of the few black people in the Navy. And um, they wanted you to just be there and be that token guy. I think you, you mentioned that moment kind of made you have kind of second thoughts about the Navy and some of the racism that you experienced there. And you ended up leaving. And yeah. one thing that I remember you saying was that you wanted to study psychology. I mean, you, you've been experiencing racism for your whole life at this point. So you wanted to study psychology so you can understand racism and why people, I would imagine why white people did the things that they do. Maybe That's even right. why black people did the things that they do. Right. So this has been a whole life study. What have you found to the some of those answers in terms of why racism and why white people do what they do? I think that there is a sense among many white people today that they're losing their country, that they're losing America to black and brown people and to people who are not the same as they, gay people, etc. There's a sense of loss in white America. And that is why you have DeSantis in Florida, 
that fool uh, uh, who was president, uh, carrying on and carrying on about the threat of people who are poisoning the blood of our nation. This is where we are. We have somehow or another come to, to this point. And I must say to you that unless America, America wakes up, and particularly black men in America, because we've been the ones who've been slackers when it comes to political involvement, black women were the ones who moved us forward, going all the way back to Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida when, when, women, black women, when women got the vote. Mm -hmm. Black men have got to step up. Mm -hmm. Now there's talk about us, black men, gravitating towards Trump. Why? So we're in a very desperate place as a country where even now we're so confused about race, particularly because of disinformation, misinformation intended to confuse us. And it just doesn't confuse white people. Some of us are confused as well. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as we approach the election of next year, we need to be very clear about what is happening in our country. Mm -hmm. Race has always been America's weakest point. It is, it, is, it is our Achilles heel. It is the thing that will bring us down if we don't solve it. And we don't solve that by being angry at each other or by going back and lashing at who did what when. We do that by saying, okay, these things happen. Let's understand what happened. Let's recognize what happened and let's move forward and let's make amends mm -hmm. for what happened in reasonable ways. And that's just my, my take on it. Got you, got you. All right, I want to definitely take a look at some of the uh, history that you have written about. I think that stands out. A lot of the history you've written about is pretty raw and as it is and very, very uncomfortable. So I just want to say that for anybody listening. But before we get into that, I don't want to just talk about all the bad. When you, learned, when you were discovering these things within history, what were some things that kind of made you feel good? Like made you feel like, you know, really proud and good learning about mm -hmm. history? I purchased five acres of land in Rosewood in 2008, pristine land, untouched since 1923. Uh, Rosewood is now all rural, uh, uh, totally rural, white families, uh, no black people out there. And one Saturday I was on my property and a white man in a pickup truck with a shotgun in the back window rolled up, rolled up to me and asked me, what are you doing out here? Hmm. And I said, well, this is my property and I'm just uh, getting ready to, uh, to do some investigation. He said, you own this land? I said, yes, I do. He said, well, I'm having some friends over, some guys over tomorrow for a, a beer party, come over and see us. 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, I'm right down the street, right down the road, it's all rural up there. I said, oh, cool, cool. I'll, I'll show up tomorrow morning. And I go, I get there about 11.30. There were five guys there. They were already three sheets of the wind drunk when I got there. <laughs> they, they had a head start on me. And we visited, I visited with my neighbors for about three hours. And they wanted to, they wanted to make me, this is important. I'm so glad you asked this question. They wanted me to know that the reason white people in Rosewood were so upset about the whole history of Rosewood and all that was because their side of the story never got told mm. that they had grand great grandparents and what have you who protected black people during the massacre of 1923 hid people got shot, shotguns that stood out and refused to allow people to be taken why don't you historians tell that part and on and they were right that did happen not nearly enough folks did that but they, the point that they wanted to make with me because they knew that I'm a I'm a historian, was that you all need to be at least fair in telling the truth that some white people did the right thing at the right in in those terrible moments. And they're correct about that. And then they said to me, now you y'all people think that we're crackers. They they were self-defined. We're crackers, they said to me. We don't mind being called crackers. We're proud of it. And they said to me, now they think we hate black people. We don't hate black black people, but uh, do you believe in Jesus Christ? I hadn't been to church in six months. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you're okay with us, they said. Me and Jesus, tight. I just left church last week. Jesus and I will do it. The point is, as far as they were concerned, that Christian views and, and morality was more important than their racial views, which I found to be rather revealing and interesting. 
Indeed, indeed. Some people might not know exactly what you're talking about with uh, Rosewood. Maybe they haven't seen a movie. Maybe they just don't know the history. So could you give us a quick maybe debriefing on exactly what Rosewood was and why sure. why it was significant? Why are you on land there? Sure, sure. Well, uh, Rosewood uh, is located 40 miles due west of Gainesville, right before you, nine miles before the Gulf of Mexico. Because it's on the Gulf, it was an area where rosewood trees, cypress trees that take hundreds of years to grow, beautiful trees, they produce this wood that's absolutely valuable. Well, those trees were very, very, very plentiful in that area in the 1840s and 50s when white people came in, loggers came in and started logging out rosewood trees. Mm-hmm. And about 90% of the pencils in America came from rosewood trees in Rosewood, Florida. Mm. But when the rosewood trees were all timbered out, the white folks left. And black people began leasing and buying land and planting slash palm trees and doing turpentine work. And they were very, very successful in Rosewood in the 1920s. When in 1923, a white woman named Fanny Taylor, two miles away from Rosewood, going towards the Gulf Coast, a a lumber town, uh, claimed that a black man had, had assaulted her. 1923, around Christmas time, New Year's, change of the season time. The fact of what happened was that this woman, a white woman, married, was uh, had a white boyfriend who came by her house and abused her when her husband wasn't there. And she used that lie in order to justify her being physically abused to justify this man, her boyfriend, who had come through Rosewood and, and who had beaten her. And that is what set this mob in 1923, walking two miles down the railroad track to Rosewood to find this black man who had who had assaulted this white woman. Such a person, of course, did not exist. And that is what led to this the destruction of this town. Had about 300 black families doing very very well. Everybody left. It was very cold. January of 19 of uh, uh, 23 was extremely cold. People had never seen cold weather like that. So you had this mob come through. People left their houses in, in their night clothes. Mm. You had children taking care of children in those woods for three or four days until they could finally get some of these people out of there. So that was Rosewood. Every, all the black people left. White people then bought, purchased the land, and now it's an all-white community. Uh, but I went there back in 1997, just on a lark knowing very little about the community, and I found the railroad track. I found the remnants of the railroad track that was used to evacuate several of the people. Hmm. And uh, I purchased five acres of that land. Today I own the co-partner, the only section of the Rosewood Railroad track uh, that that, that still exists. One of the questions about Rosewood, just like a lot of these massacres, is, you know, how many people died? so on record, how many people did they say died from Rosewood? And then based on your research, what you've looked at, things that you've done, how many do you think is the, the realistic number is? The record says six blacks and two whites. Hmm. Uh, the record's probably wrong. We don't really know how many black people were, were killed. I think the, the, even the number of whites were killed, is, is, killed is, is a question because some of them were wounded during the course of this battle at the Kerry House where most of the activity took place. So the record, the record shows six blacks and two whites, but I'm not sure about that. We're trying to find out just where the six black victims are buried in Rosewood. The record shows that they are buried in the in the colored, colored cemetery in Rosewood, but it's, it seems to me that they may be buried two miles away in Sumner where all this mess started. So without going into a lot of details about who's buried where, we're now involved in a very intensive investigation to determine where the known six black res- uh, victims of Rosewood are buried. We know where the two white victims are buried. I take I take my uh, Teach the Truth tours to Rosewood to visit the grave sites of the two white people who protected black people, who owned that, uh, the, the J.W. Wright property. This was a man, white man and his wife who ran the general, general store who protected black people until the train could get them out. So I go to the cemetery where these two people are buried, but also one of the white men who was a part of the riot is also buried there. Mm-hmm. So it's a very complicated story in the sense that we're still trying to determine how many black people were killed and 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 where all these people went. We, we still don't know for sure. Mm-hmm. 
That is interesting. Um, so uh, there's a lot of these incidents. I don't want to go over every single one. But one of the things that, that always stands out to me about uh, the South and um, it was, you know, lynching. Florida was one of the worst places when it came to lynching. Yes. So I'm trying to figure out, like, why would someone organize an event and have food and family and all these things and then afterwards um, hang, you know, a black person and then sometimes cut off different parts, fingers, mm -hmm. um, body parts, feet, toes, whatever, um, yes. and sometimes the testicles um, yes. and store them for as almost a trophy. And, yes. you know, it's almost as if they, they caught, uh, you know, this ferocious tiger and they're taking all the parts and, you know, bragging about it later on. So yeah. I know you have interviewed descendants of those that have lynched other people and things like that. What have you seen to be some of the psycho? It's almost like looking at like a serial killer, but not really because yeah. these people are doctors, they're lawyers, they're politicians. They're the professionals of the town that are doing these things. So what exactly was the psychology of the people doing these things at this time? Like why would you have to do all that and, and take these parts and save them and torture the people that, that you're, you're trying mm -hmm. to, it, like what, what have you found to be kind of the- That's a sex. There were some, not many, white men who were lynched in Florida and elsewhere, not many. Uh, for cattle wrestling or murder, things like that. But there's not one instance that I know of in which a white man who was lynched was castrated. Mm. That was something reserved for black men and boys. Uh, why? That the answer to that is because of sexual uh, animosity and perversion and competition, as white men saw it. Black men were beasts, sexual beasts that had to be subdued, killed if they got out of line. So, the kind of mutilation that we're talking about, particularly sexual mutilations, were reserved for black men because of, I think the the sexual insecurities of white men who, who lynched them. Let's take Claude Neal. Do you know that story? I learned that story. I learned that story from you, sir. I learned that story from you. And it 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 made me so uncomfortable. I'm like, I think I was eating, maybe, like, I, I don't know if I was eating something, but it made me so uncomfortable that I had to pause for a second and really think about and conceptualize eating your own, like, yeah. Well, let, 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 oh, yeah, let, let's tell that story. Claude Neal was a black man in Jackson County, Florida, very close to the Georgia line, who had a relationship with a white girl who lived on property next to his aunt's property. And they must have had some sort of disagreement. And the girl was found dead, beaten to death in a horrible circumstance. And suspicion turned towards Claude Neal because his aunt owned property that abutted these white people's land. And so this the sheriff is called and he goes to Claude Neal's aunt's house next door. He finds blood, bloody clothing mm. that Claude Neal's aunt had tried to wash. And they find tracks leading from the scene where they found the woman back to this, the Claude Neal's aunt's house. So Claude Neal was arrested, suspected of killing this white girl. And as this story evolved in Jackson County, thousands of people became enraged and came to the property where this happened, the Kennedy family, the white girl's the family, to deal with this situation. And it's one of those few cases in racial history where the police did the right thing. They arrested Claude and they took him from Jackson County to yet another county to try to protect, to try to protect him. The mob came there. They took him from that county to another county. The mob found him there. Mm. They, they took Claude Neal to the Pensacola naval station brig to try to keep him away from the mob and they found him there they finally took uh claude neal to alabama because cl close to, uh, to the florida line and that's where the, the mob found him there and took him wow back to back back to to to, uh, to mariana and there were so many people gathered thousands of them that wanted to see this lynching that a committee of six white men was appointed to take him out and lynch him and, and bring the body back. And these six men did that. They took uh, Claude out 
and we have a very detailed description of what they did to him. It survives in the historical record. They dismembered, they, they cut off his fingers. They made him eat his own genitals. They tied him to the back of a truck, then drug him back to the scene where all these people were, were, were waiting to see the body. And little white children, members of the Kennedy family, the girls' family, came out and stabbed his dead body with sticks. And then they took Neil and hung him at the, at the, at the county courthouse. That tree still stands. I've been there several times. Hung him. I talked to his, his, his daughter, who was four or five years old when this happened, and told me, Dr. Don, I go by that tree, because she's still in Jackson County. She's one of the few members of his family who didn't leave. Mm-hmm. And she said, I go by that tree, Dr. Don, I, I still remember my daddy. Wow. So, you know, the, the thing about Claude Neal's lynching in 1934 was that it was such a widely known lynching. It made the news all over the country before it happened. Let me repeat that. The Claude Neal lynching made news across America as they were trying to find him. So everybody knew he was going to be lynched. It was in the newspapers. Wow. President, President uh, 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 Roosevelt knew this lynching was going to happen and it still happened. And wow. because of that, America started to think differently about lynchings after Claude Neal. That such a thing could happen when everybody knew, the state knew, the president knew, and he still got lynched. White America started to really turn its eye on lynchings. And after Claude Neal in 1934, lynchings became more private affairs, where the family would take, the, the aggrieved family would take the supposed uh, 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 aggressor out and lynch the person privately. We found the stump that remains from the tree that he was lynched on. And in three weeks, I'm going to Jackson County with a film, a, a documentary filmmaker. And we're going to retrieve the tree that Claude Neal was lynched on and bring it to Rosewood and have it, have it as a part of our uh, museum at Rosewood. Mm. Wow. Mm. That is one of those pieces of history that is super uncomfortable to listen to or to read about. But... I think it's a it's it's necessary because you don't really sometimes understand the gravity of that time period and what was happening. But that story right there, I think, tells you just what exactly was happening in the South um, during this time and the danger of, you know, within any given moment in time that these things can happen and no yeah. one could stop it. You know, you're talking about him traveling from one spot to another and they're traveling to go and get him like that is the determination well, see, like, but you know the, the reason that the mom knew where he was was because the police told him uh, you know, they, they were taken to this county and the county some informant among the police in that county was he's here come get him take him someplace else some other informant within the police he's here come get him you know Claude, I dwell upon that story because it, it so much reveals how cruel it was I can't tell the Claude Neal story in schools. I can't tell kids kids exactly what happened to that man. So, you know, we, we, we have a lot of ground to cover in Florida history, some of which is not appropriate for children, but all of which is appropriate for us as adult people mm-hmm. trying to understand our history. Indeed, indeed. Another lynching that you uh, you talk a lot about was Willie James Howard. So what, what about that do you think is, is um, important for people to, to understand? Willie James Howard was Florida's Emmett Till before there was an Emmett, an Emmett Till. Willie James Howard was, was a 15-year-old black boy who worked in Live Oak, Florida, downtown in a five-and-dime store during Christmas break. And he was very smart, a smart dresser as well. And it was unusual for a black boy to get to work inside the store. But there he was in this position, unusual as it was. And he fell in love with a white girl in that store, 17-year-old Cynthia Goff, whose father was a former member of the Florida House of Representatives. And Willie James wrote this girl a letter, a love letter that was discovered by her father, who took two other white men and went to this boy's house on a Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Willie James knew they were after him. He was at the five, at the five and dime store and heard they were coming to get him. So he runs home to his mama. He's on the front porch. She's sitting in the rocking chair. He's, he's uh, holding her around the legs. And this car drives up with these three white men, including this girl's father. They take Willie James at gunpoint from his mother, take him to where his father worked. 
made his father get into the car and took this boy to the Swanee River, tied his hands and feet on the way there, got there, put a gun to his head and told him jump. And Willie James's father prayed for him, gave him his Bible, his little pocket Bible, and Willie James Howard, 15 years old, jumped in that river and drowned. And he was buried without a hard grave for 40 years or more. Man. We tell now, that story. Now I can't imagine the powerlessness that a father feels knowing there's nothing that he can do to save his son's life. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That speaks so much to the pain of black history. This dad had to say to him, son, I'm glad you went to church. That's, that's what Mr. James Howard told everybody later. I told my son, give, he took his little Bible that Willie James carried and said, I'm, son, I'm glad you went to church and watched his boy. And then they took his father, James Howard, back to his workplace to finish his shift. James Howard worked at a lumber yard in Labo and he watched his son lynch and then was taken back to finish his shift. When he got home that night, he didn't tell his wife where Willie James was. Mrs. Howard did not know where, what had happened to her son for three weeks. Wow. All James Howard told her was that Willie James is not coming home. He was their only child. They had one child, and he was killed in this way. So I take students to Willie James's grave. I take teachers to Willie James's grave. And we pray and we sing, and I and I ask students in particular, are you all angry at white folks for what they what happened to Willie James Howard in 1944? And they say, no, we're not angry at white people for what happened to him. We're angry because we didn't we didn't know we, we weren't taught about Rosewood, about Willie James, about Okoye, about all the things that we do on these tours that I take students on. Mm -hmm. So you know, my mission is to bring history back to life by taking high school students and a parent or a grandparent for free to these places like Rosewood where these things happened and to have them walk that bloody ground and connect with the ancestors who suffered there and then take those stories back home and tell them around the Christmas tree, around the Thanksgiving table. That's how we pass on back history, orally, by telling each other what happened, like we're doing tonight. That's how we save our stories Right, right, right. Oh, man. Um, so along with that, uh, just you personally, like you're doing a lot of work. You've seen a lot of things happen when it comes to U.S. history into present day. You know, as a black person that has experienced Jim Crow and seen the worst of this country into today, where do you view, like, do you see do you view it like a lot has changed? Progress has been made? Do we still have a long way to go? Like, where, where, where are your viewpoints from where we started to where we are? When, when I hear a young black person say to me, Dr. Don, nothing's changed. These crackers are just as bad as it was back during slavery. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, things have changed, and you're incorrect about that. Not nearly enough has changed. But don't take the view that nothing's changed. Barack was president, goddammit. Excuse me, my, my language. Don't say nothing has changed. Not enough has changed. What America has done is to have failed to reach the most alienated part of the black community, the poor people who are, who are trapped in ghettos and slums and public housing, unemployed. America has not reached that segment of the black population, which is about a third of us about a third of, of us, of, uh, about a third of black people have been mired in, pub, in poverty going back to the 1950s, if you took measurements. And not much has changed, 29% to 35% over the last 80 years, over the last eight decades. So when will we crack that nut? That is when America will grow, when we figure out how to bring in the most alienated, the folks who are most challenged to find work that is self-sustaining. What does America do about those people? And right now, what America is saying is nothing. Mm. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. But what do you do when you don't have boots? That's something to think about, right? For sure. Before we close out, I can't, I can't have you here and not talk about uh, some of the things that, that are happening in the Florida education system. The whole AP Black history was a big problem. Um, and now, you know, Governor DeSantis is, is saying that you know, the, the, the whole woke thing, you know, he has a woke act where 
teachers cannot teach certain things and you know you you've been pretty vocal about being against that um so for those that are not clear about what exactly that is can you explain exactly what that woke act is mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. your, your issues with it and then let's say mm -hmm. let's say governor DeSantis becomes president like what 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 could this look like nationally like what what are your issues with it and what is it I am one of the seven professors who have uh, sued the state of Florida over the woke act at the at the university level at the university level uh, the woke act says we cannot talk about institutional racism I was teaching at Florida International University before Ron DeSantis was born. I was on aircraft carriers, on the bridge of, air, of aircraft carriers in the United States Navy defending my country before Ron DeSantis was born. And now he's gonna tell me I can't teach certain things in, in the school system, in the state uh, university system. I can't teach about racism. I can't mention institutional racism. Florida was born in institutional racism. Name one institution that was not racist in Florida. So the problem we have now is that we have a governor and we have a legislature that gives him everything he wants, who is saying, forget about racial oppression in the past, forget about slavery, uh, forget about all those things and teach forward that we're a great country. And I refuse to do that. We are a great country. That's not wrong. He's, all, he's right about that. But we're not this right-wing, quasi-Nazi, on the edge of, of, of autocracy uh, a country that Trump and DeSantis is, is moving us towards. So my sense and my purpose is to resist that at my very bone. I don't need money. I, I don't need accolades. I appreciate you all inter interviewing me, but I don't really give a damn about that. I am going to do everything I can to make sure that the people who have an inclination to at least listen to me realize that we are in danger. We being black people at this moment, and we beyond black people meaning, meaning Americans at this moment. We're about to lose our country, and we're about to lose our history. And if y'all don't excuse the term man up, at this moment, the ancestors will be disappointed in all of us. Speak up. Vote, goddammit. Vote. If nothing else, at least vote. If nothing else, at least do that. And if you don't vote, then don't complain about what happens when Trump becomes president. Mm. Um, you got me started. You asked the question, got me onto it. I just, you know, we need to do what we need to do to prevent this Holocaust, this black Holocaust that's mm. about to happen to us. Man, man, oh man. It is, uh, it is quite, quite an interesting thing, like just to observe you know, some of these uh, hypocrisies because, you know, there are, you know, there's AP history in um, different other cultures and things like that. And I'm sure, mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's some graphic pieces of that history that's that's talked about. Totally right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's okay until it, it you know, we nailed it. It, until right. it becomes comf uncomfortable when it comes to us. And it's like, it, it makes you think about too, like the power of learning that history it kind of comes to the forefront. The question I asked you in the beginning, like if the history is not that powerful, then why, why do they, you know, prevent it from being taught at such a high level all over the country, not just Florida, but mm -hmm. it's a problem all over the country. If you're telling the truth about history and how it happened to black people. All right. Well said, my man. Yes, sir. So, um, you know, I've learned a lot from your work, uh, Dr. Dunn. Um, I appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, would love to have you back on the program. I was almost before with you, right? We were a few, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. On. Yeah, 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 yeah. And my wife said, and she keeps my count on it. She takes care of these things for me. Why are you back on him again? Back on, you got CNN <laughs> again. MSNBC, who is this little dude just taking an hour and a half of your time? Ooh. But, you know, you're, you're, you're talking to people that we need to talk to. Um, uh, because I, you, I, you young people, if you if you guys don't get on this, I'm 83 years old. I you know I'm done, guys. After this round, you all need to step up. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, and, and, and this is one of the things that I talk about, too, when I talk to kids. It's like we're talking about black history. We're talking about the Dr. Dunn's we're talking about King. We're talking about Malcolm X. Who's going to continue the legacy? They didn't they didn't die in vain. You didn't do all the work that you did just so that it can stop when when, you know, that time comes. Who's going to continue to do the work? We can't just sit here and admire, right. you know admire the work and clap and do all these things and and no one is continuing the mission so i think that what you're saying is super important and i think that you know black people all over especially younger black people have to really think about how they can continue the legacy of amazing people like you that have been really doing work for us for a long time you know well i appreciate that and i really thank you for bringing me uh uh forward this night to talk to folks a little bit about what we're so much concerned about. Yes, sir. And uh, before we close out, Dr. Dunn, um, what, what is the legacy that you, you want to leave behind? Um, there's so much that you've done um, from the psychological component to the historical component to these tours now. And, you know, you talking against some of the injustices. What What is the legacy that you, you want to leave behind? Only restraint on my speech that I respect is civility. Uh, America is at a crossroads in which we are being silenced and I will not allow it to happen to me. We must speak, even if it costs us dearly, we must speak. Uh, and I hope that my legacy is my written work. I hope that my legacy is my children, obviously. And I hope that my legacy is an attribute to my parents, who were migrant workers, who made me what I am today, without question. Mm. Man, thank you so much, Dr. Dunn, for coming on the program. Uh, before we leave out, I'm sure people are wondering where they can find your book, um, where they can find you yes. and uh, some of the work that you're doing. Thank you for asking. Uh, the work that we're doing can be found on Miami Center for Racial Justice dot org. I repeat that Miami Center for Racial Justice dot org, which tells of uh, the, the things that we're doing. Uh, my work is uh, available on DunHistory dot com. Films, interviews, all kinds of things that I've been working on for the last fifty years is on DunHistory dot com, and I invite you to visit both those places and come to Miami. And, you know, we have things going on here. So uh, come down and visit us, please. I will I will definitely take you up on that. And um, hopefully uh, we can chat in person, uh, Dr. Dunn. Again, thank you so much. Uh, before we close out, can you leave us uh, with your favorite quote and what it means to you? Actually, I just gave it to you. I'll repeat it. Mm -hmm. The only restraint upon my speech that I respect is civility. I'm an American. There it is. There it is, Dr. Dunn. It was a pleasure. Um, definitely one of you. Definitely one of, was one of my top people that I wanted to interview. So I'm glad that uh, we were able to get this done. Um, and you know, hopefully, we can have you back on. Um, you've done so much work, uh, listeners. Uh, definitely check out Dr. Dunn's work. Uh, it could be a whole Black History curriculum. Um, within itself and uh, it is powerful work that he's done over the years and he's done himself you know he didn't wait for anybody to tell him that these things needed to be done and without him actually doing these things we would not have some of the things that we have as far as the information because before Dr. Dunn there wasn't that much black history in Florida that was actually uncovered and that's kind of why the re you know the reason why he he's done so much work so uh, definitely check him out. And of course, remember, your mind is the most powerful tool in the universe. If you can think it, you can do it. If you believe in it, you can be it. And if you fight for it, you can have it. The world is yours. This has been your host, Mr. G, and I will see you next time on Mastermind. Uh, so every day I'm going hard. I'm talking business, bank accounts and credit cards. And somehow we defeat the odds and making sure that no one starves illegal or you had it.